This indeed is one of the highlights of my year to be here at spring and to be here for the lectureship. I suppose we don't realize how important things are oftentimes until we lose them. And so the opportunity to be here and to be in fellowship with you, brethren, and to enjoy the singing and the worship that is taking place here this week is a real delight to me. Uh, this year I'm privileged to have with me my wife, Lillian, and my son, Jason, uh, two of my ardent supporters and encouragers, and it's always good to have them with me. I appreciate uh, the congregation here, the eldership, Brother David Brown, I love him dearly. Uh, it's our privilege this year to stay with the Cones, and that's been a wonderful experience, and we appreciate their hospitality to us. I want to begin this afternoon looking at uh, some verses out of Colossians chapter 1, if you'll open your New Testament. I want to look, first of all, at Colossians 1 and verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Then skipping a few verses, let's go down to verse 21. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Now notice this next phrase. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. As we look through these verses, there is an emphasis upon the transition that takes place between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of God's dear Son. That's sometimes referred to as conversion. It is the rebirth process that brings us out of that one state of darkness or death into the marvelous light of the kingdom of Christ. How does that happen? It happens through a process of teaching. We do not uh, make that transition without knowing and learning about and being taught about what needs to be done to make that transition possible. It doesn't just happen. One doesn't accidentally become a member of God's kingdom. It is through the process of teaching. Christianity is a taught religion and is a teaching religion. And there is an emphasis in these verses also on the fact that we are to remain faithful if we remain grounded in the faith then there's a certain end that is in mind that is to be our goal, our purpose. And what a great lesson we heard this past hour on the hope of heaven. The very reason of that transition taking place is that we might spend eternity in heaven. But it's not just a question of whether or not we've been baptized as a result of the teaching that we have heard and heeded. It's a question of remaining faithful and true to the word of God from that point in time onward that we might one day have heaven as our home. You see, the promise of heaven is conditional. We must remain faithful to God to the very day that we die in order for heaven to be ours. What a great theme this week we are studying. The need in each of our lives to remain faithful to God. 
to remain faithful to his word. And the process by which we remain faithful is not in isolation from one another, but rather in association with one another that we might encourage and grow in our love for God and in our love for one another. And let me say, when we talk about love for one another as brethren, there are some of us, I won't name any names, that are harder to love than others. But we need to love the brethren. We are not in this uh, task of being faithful to God by ourselves. We are in a, an association, a fellowship with one another in which we have a responsibility to one another to encourage each other to remain faithful to the Lord. Christians have the obligation to continue to teach those who have been baptized especially those as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. We cannot just forget those who have recently been converted. We need to encourage them to grow and to study the pages of God's word that they might remain faithful to him. Peter's admonition at the very close of his second epistle is important to us this hour that we may grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. The truth of the matter is, when we look at the Great Commission stated in Matthew 28 verses 18 through 20, we as a brotherhood have neglected both parts of that commission too often. We've neglected to teach the lost, the gospel of Christ, and we've also neglected to teach those who have been baptized that they might remain faithful and true to the word of God. All Christians must remain faithful to Christ and must therefore do everything, according to Jesus' words in Matthew 28 and verse 20, everything taught in the scriptures to remain faithful to the Lord and to his word. Christians are born into the household of God, which is the church of the living God, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. When they are baptized or born again by water and the Spirit, John 3 and verse 5. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made to drink into one spirit. Again, this one body is the church, according to Ephesians chapter 1, 22 and 23. And Christians are all part of that one body. And make no mistake here, there are no Christians outside of that one body because the Lord adds all of those that are saved to that church. Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. And there is no salvation outside of that one body because Jesus is said to be the Savior of the body in Ephesians 5 and verse 23. But notice very carefully that all Christians are to be found within the community of those of like precious faith. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. As a part of God's family or a household, we are all brethren. The church is therefore sometimes referred to as the brotherhood and we are all commanded in 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 17 to love the brotherhood. Peter also wrote of our conversion in this way, seeing ye have purified your souls by obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22. Notice especially the words of this verse, unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. This love described by Peter here among brethren and for the brethren 
is to be according to inspiration unfeigned, that is, not pretended. It is to be sincere. Christians are to genuinely love one another with a pure heart, so says Peter here. In fact, Jesus said, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another, John 13 and verse 35. This means that the love for one another within the body of Christ, the church, is to be one of the identifying characteristics that distinguish true Christians from others that are in the world. Peter describes the intensity of this love with the term fervently. This means that love for the brethren is to be ardent, intense, continual. It is not to be cold and indifferent and formal, but strong and extensive, including all saints, the poor as well as the rich, and the lesser as well as the greater. James chapter 2, verse 1. In the first chapter of 2 Peter, in fact, in verse 7, brotherly kindness or love is listed among those things which we commonly refer to as Christian graces. At the very end and the conclusion of the list that Peter gives, he states this, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice carefully, the promise that is given here by Peter is conditional. If these things be in you, including brotherly love or kindness, if these things be in you is the beginning of the condition. Notice also the word abound. It is not only necessary to have these characteristics, and under our view now is brotherly kindness or love, it is also clearly to be understood from these words that it is also necessary to have these things in abundance. In other words, a person can have these characteristics to a degree and not abound in these characteristics. The concern we should have then is whether the qualities are growing and increasing in us, grow in brotherly love. The real emphasis should be placed in our minds upon growth. Are we growing and abounding in brotherly love? Well, as we answer that question, we're answering also to the, an extent as to whether or not we are remaining faithful to Christ, faithful as Christians, faithful to the Word of God, for this is clearly a requirement. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, Paul lists the fruit of the Spirit. The first on the list is love, and love would include, as we're talking about this hour, brotherly love. When we bear fruit, we should always be concerned about bearing much fruit. Jesus stated, God's interest in disciples, fruit abundant bearing. When he stated in John chapter 15 and verse 2, Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So how much do we love the brethren? Are we growing in our brotherly love? In fact, Jesus goes on and emphasizes that bearing fruit glorifies God, and the discipleship is based at least in part upon our bearing much fruit. He said, Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, and so shall ye be my disciples. Growing in love, including brotherly love, is inherent in bearing the fruit of the Spirit. The stark reality of the importance of loving brethren is found in this statement of John. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. 
We can know that we have truly passed from the realm of Satan, here described as death, to the kingdom of God's dear Son or the kingdom of light. Why, John? If and because we love the brethren. Loving the brethren is not the cause of this change or transition. But John says it is one evidence that the transition or the conversion has taken place. And according to John, according to the Holy Spirit here, it is the difference between life and death. It is the difference between eternity with God on the one hand and the torments of hell. There are certainly other indicators of the reality of that change and transition. But John tells us here that brotherly love is an indicator of whether we have truly been converted to Christ. Those who do not love their brethren abide in death. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20, John wrote, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? In spite of what men may say, it is impossible, impossible to love God and hate, and may I add, not love, their brethren. To remain faithful to Christ, we must grow in brotherly love. So having said that, what is then brotherly love? Brotherly love certainly needs to be clearly defined and understood because often, as Brother David said, love and brotherly love in particular are given meanings that do not coincide with the teachings of the Bible. When we think about love and love of the brethren, we need to think about actions, not just words. In 1 John 3 and verse 18, John wrote, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Truth defines love. God defines love in his word. When we consider love, we first think of God's love. We love him because he first loved us. 1 John 4 verse 19. We know what love is by God's love, and we know God's love by what God has done. Truly, God is love, 1 John 4, verse 8. The verse that best describes and defines God's love is often called the golden text of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. This love is not just an emotion. Love is the willingness to sacrifice of self for the ultimate good of the ones that are loved. Love is manifested by actions, sacrifice, giving. Note again, a result of God's love is that we love him in return. The proper response to his love for us is to love him in return. How do we do that? Well, we do that. According to Jesus' own words in John 14, verse 15, by keeping his commandments. When we obey his commandments, that means that we are willing to deny ourselves, Luke chapter 9, verse 23, and sacrifice of ourselves for the sake of the one that is loved. Think about Brother West's lesson earlier today on that body, that living sacrifice that is to be given to God. It is our love for God engendered by his love for us that motivates our obedience to God from the very beginning in the gospel plan of salvation and then throughout the remainder of our lives in his service through the church. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Ephesians 3 and verse 21. John wrote again in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. 
Christ demonstrated his love. He said, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, he said, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Jesus here speaks of laying down his life. We know that he loved us because he laid down his life for those that he loved. No man took his life. He gave it freely for the world. He said, no man taketh it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my father, John chapter 10, verse 18. He suffered so much for us while he was here on this earth. From his birth, where there was no room for him in the end, Luke 2, verse 7. Through his life, we had no place to lay his head, Matthew 8 and verse 20. To the agonizing, undeserved, and humiliating death on a criminal's cross at Calvary, Matthew 27 and verse 46. By the way, he not only demonstrated his love for mankind in these things, but he also demonstrated his love for the Father. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 8, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Our love for one another is not an optional matter. It is commanded. Listen to Jesus. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. We not only are to love one another, because it is commanded by the Lord to do so. But we also are to love one another, listen to the words of Jesus, as in the same way that I have loved you. Again, love is demonstrated by action, by the sacrifice of self, and by giving. Make no mistake, words are important too. We should certainly express our love through words. Our words must be true and genuine. And therefore our words must demonstrate our love for God, for Christ, and for our brethren. Notice carefully. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16. Let these words sink deeply into our minds. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. This is the biblical definition for loving the brethren. How do we do that? We lay down our lives for the brethren. When we regard our own love for the brethren, that ought to motivate us to give of ourselves for the sake of the well-being of our brethren. Listen to Paul. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 15, he wrote, And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Now listen. Listen. We can all relate to this. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. He was willing to be used up in the service of his brethren, even though he realized that his love was not always reciprocated. Brotherly love is to be given whether that love is appreciated or not. Paul is a great example of that. He gave himself in the service of others, in the preaching of the gospel of Christ, in traveling to distant places, in being in want, and many other things that could be listed. He did this according to his own inspired words, gladly. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 20 through 27, Paul speaks of his self-sacrifice, and after this list of things that he endured for the elect's sake, he states, Besides those things that are without, that which cometh among me daily, the care of all the churches. 
We know that Paul loved the brethren by his willingness to gladly endure the hardships and by his perseverance in preaching to the lost and encouraging the brethren to remain faithful to Christ. Love is manifested in word, but especially by deed. Again, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, John wrote, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Certainly we ought to express our love for the brethren with our words. But the most powerful, profound way to express our love is by what we do. The preceding verse, verse 17 in that same chapter of 1 John, illustrates how love is either demonstrated or denied. John said, But whoso hath the world's goods, and beholdeth his brother in need, and shutteth up his compassion from him, how doth the love of God abide in him? Helping brethren who are in need demonstrates genuine brotherly love. In Galatians chapter 6, we have mention of a couple of things that should be done to show our love for the brethren. Paul first calls attention to the spiritual needs of brethren. The problem of sin is under consideration in the opening verses of the chapter. And Paul there states emphatically, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. To be clear, Paul has just written about brethren overtaken in a trespass. And he mentions the obligation of the spiritual toward those in that situation. God wants us to restore such a one. Galatians 6 verse 1. This is the kind of burden that sometimes brethren need help in bearing. The instruction, admonition, And correction help those who are in sin to know what they need to do to find relief from their spiritual burdens, the burdens of sin. The role of fellow Christians is an important one because without their help, the erring brother or sister in Christ may remain lost without even realizing or identifying the sin that has occurred in their lives. How is that possible? Sin often comes into a person's life so gradually and quietly that it goes unnoticed by the one engaged in the sin. Sin is deceptive, and the devil can convince a person that sin is harmless and perhaps even beneficial. The spiritual are to point the erring to the forgiveness that is in Christ. And the fact that repentance and prayer are needed for forgiveness, Acts 8 and verse 22. Someone has to love them enough to point out the sin and the sin's consequences so that the erring Christian can be rescued from the bondage of sin again and forgiven by God. Christians can help bear the spiritual burdens of brethren by offering to them the guidance of God's word and urging them to obey God and turn away from sin. Later in the same chapter, Paul urges Christians with these words in Galatians 6 and verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Under consideration here are benevolent needs of brethren and the obligation especially on the part of brethren to supply those needs which can be supplied. Benevolence, supplying the needs of others, is to be extended to all. Make that clearly in mind. To the extent that Christians have the ability to help, It is a means by which others might come to know the truth. It's through those acts of kindness. Jesus so states in Matthew 5 and verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Surely good works would include supplying the physical needs of others. Paul's statements emphasize that the realm of good works is 
Christians should give priority to those who are of the household of faith, that is, the brethren. Colossians 3, verse 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. There's a special responsibility that we have as brethren to those of like precious faith to provide the things that are lacking for one another. Love of the brethren can be seen and identified by the willingness of brethren to sacrifice of what they have in order to provide for the needs of others, especially those that are brethren. One of the purposes of every assembly of the church is to encourage one another in love and good work. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Love and good works. These two things are tied together and both are to be encouraged or provoked among brethren on an ongoing, continual basis in every assembly of the body of Christ. Neither love nor good works happen without effort. And encouragement and the Lord's design for the church provides regular opportunities for both of these to be increased through fellowship and worship. Love also requires that we confront and expose and correct sin in brethren. Brethren have the obligation to warn the unruly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 14. And by unruly, we need to understand that to mean those who do not follow the rules of God's Word. We have a responsibility if we love the brethren and care about their soul's salvation to warn the unruly. Brethren have the obligation to reprove and rebuke, according to Paul's statement to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2. Knowing the peril of sin, sin that is not repented of, brethren motivated by love will approach the person involved in sin an attempt to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. It's a sobering thought to recognize that sin can creep into any of our lives, to cause a condition in our own lives where we need brethren to love us enough to come to us and warn us about the danger that we're destined to have if we fail to repent of our sins. Restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Loving brethren will motivate us sometimes to do difficult but righteous things in order to save the souls of those that are loved. I like the words used by a brother in Christ who wrote in the preface of his book, Caring Enough to Correct, these words. Deceived by a perverted view of love, leaders of the church too often tolerate immorality. Fearful of the reactions of false teachers and those who follow them, the leaders of the church too often allow error to go unchallenged. The result is a church confused in doctrine and compromising in morals. If the ties of brotherly love mean anything, it means that Christians care enough to correct. Notice well, brethren, 
that the leaders of the church, the elders in the church, have a responsibility to lead us in the path of brotherly love and in caring enough to correct those who are in error. This same author wrote later in his book, for a family to ignore or tolerate wrongdoing among its members. It's not a sign of love. It is irresponsibility. You do not love a brother. You do not love a brother if you let him go to hell rather than discipline him out of his sin. Some are so short-sighted that they refuse to administer the momentary sorrow of discipline and hence allow a brother to be eternally damned. Christian discipline is a family matter. When one receives discipline, it is because brothers and sisters in the church regard him as a special person. I like that. Because they love him as a brother or a sister in Christ, they care enough about his soul to confront him with his sin. We all as Christians need to grow in our love. In our love as defined by God's word for God, for Christ, for the church, for our brethren. And by so doing, we will grow closer to God and grow closer to each other. Such closeness will cause us to be stronger and will enable the church to grow and become stronger too. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14. I thank you for your kind attention.